When I was recently in New York City for my interview with Sting, I worked at a place called The Power Station, which is now part of Berklee College of Music. Power Station used to be a studio called Avatar back in the late 90s, and I worked there one time in 1999. And I worked on a project that Kevin Shirley, who's an old friend of mine, incredible producer, was mixing. And this is the only time I've ever really been starstruck. And it wasn't meeting Kevin. It was actually on probably the third or fourth day I was there for the mixing of this record that I was walking down the hall from Studio D to Studio C. Now, Studio C is the studio that I did the Sting interview in. Okay, so it's on the same floor, but just right down the hall. So I get up to go get something to eat, get it from the couch in the lounge. I'm just hanging out in the lounge. I start walking in the hall, and about 10 steps down the hall, a tall guy starts walking towards me. I look at him, I go, oh my God, you're Mike Brecker. And he goes, oh, oh yeah. And he, I said, my name's Rick Beato. I'm a massive fan. I mean, I acted like an idiot. He was nice, but he was heading down the hall, going to do something. And he was kind of like, okay, all right, all right, thanks, dude. So, so I thought, my one chance to meet Mike Brecker, and this is how I acted. I was just so startled to see him. Now, for those of you that don't know Michael Brecker, he is one of the greatest saxophonists that ever lived. Probably after John Coltrane, he's the guy. Some of you may know him from this recording of Joni Mitchell Live. Others of you know him from his early work with the Brecker Brothers. But probably my favorite record that Michael Brecker ever played on is a record called Cityscape by Klaus Oberman. the album Cityscape with Klaus Oakham in a challenge. Uh, it was a challenge, yeah. And uh, I, I loved the album. I really am very proud of that album. Uh, I hope we do it again. Um, Klaus Oakham is, is a really is a really unique kind of arranger. Uh, next time we do it, I'd like to spend more time. We did it fairly quickly. And the music was difficult, particularly the chords that he writes, you know. I really, what I did was I just threw the chord sheets away, you know, and used my ears because I couldn't figure out what the heck it, you know, he'd write the chord and then the strings would be playing something really bizarre. So I really, I had to uh, throw the music away. What I tried to do also, you know, was leave some space. I don't know, that was a, that was a great experience. You know, I remember another interview that I watched on YouTube. It's from the NYU Steiner School of Jazz with Dr. Dave Schroeder. He's interviewing... Chris Potter, the great saxophonist, and they're talking about why Mike Brecker kept trying to improve his playing and kept practicing. And honestly, it was because so many people copied his style. Now imagine that, that people are copying your style so much that you have to keep evolving. Check this out. And you had made the comment, the reason that Brecker continued to practice so much is because there were all these people copying his style and he wanted to make sure that he was on top of those guys. You might listen to something that Mike played, you know, in 1980 and go, wow, that's just unbelievable. And that's, and that's it. That's, that's him. But for him, it was how he played on that one day with the stuff he had been working on up till then. And then the next day was another day and another day and another day. You know, for him, it wasn't like etched in stone. It was, 
He was just trying to get better, just like everybody else. Okay, so back to my story. So Mike comes walking into the studio, into the lounge, and I'm sitting there on the couch, and he's like, Rick, right? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you want to come and hear some music? And I was like, uh, yeah. I mean, Mike Brecker's asking me if I want to come and hear something he's working on. So I get it from the couch. We go walking down the hall. We go into Studio C, and there's the engineer there and the producer, George Witte. And Mike says, hey, this is my friend Rick. Let's uh, let's play him this track that we're working on. So they start playing it, and I'm like, oh, this is, this is minor blues, like a minor blues in D. And I'm listening to it, and it gets to this section. <laughs> When the song ends, Mike says, what do you think? He looks right at me and I'm thinking, Mike Brecker's asking me what I think about this. And my first reaction was, well, when it gets to that A minor seven arpeggio, it gets to that high G, it sounds like the, the compressor's kicking in too hard on the sax. And then it goes up to the A flat. Uh, that note A flat there. And it really sounds like it's grabbing it. And he looks at the producer and engineer. He goes, that's exactly what I was just saying. And from then on, it was like we were best friends. So the next day he comes over to Studio D. I'm just hanging out. Kevin's mixing this record that, that I'm working on. So I'm just hanging out doing nothing, basically. Occasionally going in talking to Kevin. And he goes, Rick, the other guys are here. You want to come meet him? I said, yeah. So I walk over and he introduces me to Elvin Jones. Elvin Jones played with John Coltrane, one of the greatest drummers, one of my all-time favorite drummers. <laughs> Then he introduces me to Pat Metheny. So when I interviewed Pat, I said, we actually met once before here in the studio in 1999 when you were working with Michael Brecker on Time is of the Essence. Of course, Pat did not remember that, but that studio has a lot of memories for me, right? So this the few days that I was there, I actually met Ron Carter in the same studio. I actually met you one time in 1999 at Avatar Studios you and Elvin Jones in two different rooms playing two different sessions. I was in <laughs> Studio D. He was playing with Mike Brecker on the um, Time is of the Essence record. You were in Studio A, I want to say, and I met Michael Brecker the day before. He introduced me to Elvin. I walked downstairs and you walked out of Studio A. I believe it was. And I said, oh, my God, Ron Carter. And you were the nicest person. I introduced myself. I'm like, I'm Rick Beato. So within the course of about three days, I met Elvin Jones. I met Michael Brecker. I met Ron Carter. I met Pat Metheny. You know how I always say you can learn a lot by hanging out? Well, at least that week it was true. You can actually meet a lot of people, a lot of your idols, if you were at the studio during that particular week in 1999. So anyways... So Mike finishes his record. I'm still working on the record with Kevin for a couple more weeks. I come back to Atlanta. And a couple weeks later, I got a call from Mike. He's like, hey, Rick, what's up, man? I said, hey, Mike. And he said, uh, how'd the record come out? I said, it came out pretty well. And he's like, well, what are you working on now? Are you working on anything else? I said, yeah, I'm actually working on another record. He said, listen, I told you this before, but if you ever need a sax player for a session, just give me a call. I'd love to come in and work with you on something. And I was like... <laughs> Mike, I'm working with new metal bands and you don't want to play play on these records. Nothing, you know, no offense to any of the bands I worked with, but Mike Brecker on a new metal track. Well, although maybe it would have been cool, actually. <laughs> Might have made some of these records great. But we kept in touch every few months or so. We just, uh, you know, he'd call me, I'd call him. And uh, for a couple years or so, and eventually we lost touch which I really, really regret. Anyways, in 2006, I heard through the grapevine that Mike was sick uh, with some type of leukemia, I believe. And he was looking for a bone marrow, for a candidate for a bone marrow transplant. And this is when the internet really was not, it, it was hard to resource things like that. And they looked for a while. And I remember hearing that he found they found someone and he had the bone marrow transplant but it didn't take he ended up not getting better and he passed away in 2007 very tragically at the age of 57 
And that was a real crushing blow to me. I mean, this guy, not only being just this absolute genius and somebody that I looked up to, his playing, but he was just an incredibly great guy. You know, I was thinking about this, that when Chick Corea died, I remember playing, the first thing I played was the Three Quartets album that Mike is playing on. I went to see that concert, their first tour date in Ithaca, New York in 1981. It was Mike Brecker, it was Eddie Gomez on the bass, it was Steve Gadd on the drums and Chick Corea, and they were reading charts. And that's the first time I saw Mike play. And... I played that when Chick died because I thought it was important to memorialize Chick by playing some of his music. And when I think of Chick, I think of that record and I think of Mike's playing. Check out the groove. Gad. Right here. Check out the first quartet. It's mind-blowing, but there are so many great interviews on YouTube with Mike. There are amazing recordings that he did. There's two different Klaus Ogerman records that he's on, all his solo records, him as a sideman, just the Pat Metheny records, 8081 is playing on that. Oh, man, outstanding. So even though Mike is gone, he still lives through his music, and that is the way that we can honor him. That's all for now. Don't forget to subscribe. I know I always say that, but click the subscribe button so that you know when I'm going live and when I'm putting out new videos. If you're interested in my Beato book, my ear training course, or my quick lessons guitar course, you can go to my website at www.rickbeato.com. That's how I support the channel. Thank you so much for watching.